let's build a brand new virtual machine in Microsoft Azure. And we're going to do this for a Windows 10 virtual machine. Now, virtual machines have been around, of course, in Windows 10 hosts for a long time. So, for instance, if I open up my Hyper-V console, I've got several different virtual machines that I've created onto my Windows 10 computer. And when I launch one of those, I can click Start, and I'll get another Windows 10 computer that's a virtual machine inside my Windows 10 host. And, of course, this also works on Windows Server as well. Well, we can do the same thing at Microsoft Azure, but instead of having it on our physical host, we can have it at Azure as a cloud host. There is a cost to having one of these virtual machines at Azure, and the cost is based on how many resources you have on it. In other words, how much RAM, how much storage, what type of storage, type of redundancy. And we're going to go through a lot of that here as soon as we move from Hyper-V on Windows 10 into Microsoft Azure. And here's our Windows 10 desktop. I'm just going to go ahead and shut it down and we'll move off to Azure where we will create a new virtual machine and also log into it. Once we're in our Azure Services login page, and if you missed it, there is a video that I created which shows you how to get started in Azure. So just check the playlist for Azure Cloud Services on my channel and you'll be able to see how to get started. Now I'll click on More Services, just in case you don't see Virtual Machines. And I'll click on All Services, in case you don't see it there. You're going to find Virtual Machines under the Compute heading. There's Virtual Machines. You could also just click on Compute, and it will just focus on these particular types of resources. I'll click on Virtual Machines. I've already created two different Virtual Machines, so I'm just going to go ahead and add a new one. So I'll click on Add, and I'm going to refer to this as... Azure Training. Now one of the things that you cannot do is use capital letters, any special characters, or have any spaces. So I'll click OK, and there's my Azure Training resource group. Now I need a virtual machine name. I'll call it Azure Test. Under Region, we see that it's set up in the West US because it detected from my IP address that I'm on the West Coast. And so this is the closest network operating center to me. Under availability options, we see no infrastructure redundancy required. So if I do need some redundancy, which basically means it creates the same virtual machine, but in another part of the country or part of the world, then I can go ahead and choose to add an availability set, which would then allow me to have more than one location where my virtual machine is located. So that way, if one location goes down, I can continue working. Next, we have an image. I'm going to hit the drop down here. These are all the different operating systems that are supported. I'm going to choose the Windows 10 Pro, but I can also choose a server if I'd like. And creating the virtual machines are pretty much the same. You will see a difference in cost, especially based on the resources that we're about to check out. The next option we can choose is Azure Spot Instance. So if I choose that, then what's going to happen is, is I'm going to get this a lot cheaper than I would if I chose no. So this uses unused capacity from other hosts that allows us to use it for our virtual machine, and that lowers the cost. However, you might see that your response time gets much slower. So if you don't want to have a slow virtual machine, then go ahead and choose no. But if you are concerned about costs, then choose yes. I'm going to choose no here just so we don't get disconnected while we're creating our virtual machine. The next big decision that we see here is the size. And we see by default it's going to create two virtual CPUs with 8 gigabytes of memory. I'm going to hit the drop down here. So here's some other options. We can choose 7 gigs. We can choose all these different options that will change the cost but also change the responsiveness as well. If I click Select Size, then I can choose various different options as far as disks go, and it changes the cost as well. We can see all the different cost changes. And these costs really vary widely. We see the one we chose is $152, but look at this. We can go all the way down to just $11.97 if we choose this one. But it's only going to give us one gig of RAM, one virtual CPU, just not a lot of speed uh, capability when we choose this option. I suggest you go lower, and you can always add more speed and capacity later on if it turns out it's not good enough. I'm going to stick with the one that we've got and click Select. Underneath that, we see the administrator account, and it automatically filled in Azure User. 
I'm going to choose a different option I've been using for some of my other virtual machines. So I'll put in admin-1 and I'll put in a password. And if you don't have a password that is complex enough, then you will get an error. Under inbound port rules, this has to do with you being able to remote into the virtual machine from outside of the network. So we've got, by default, remote desktop protocol 3389 is open. And I definitely like to have that. If I hit the drop down, it can also open up web ports 80 and 443, as well as secure shell, which is port 22, which is typically used for PowerShell and other things uh, that have to do with programming a computer. You'll notice that there's a warning message that all IP addresses can access the virtual machine. And there is a way under the firewall to go in and lock it down to a specific IP address, which I'll show in an upcoming video. But for testing purposes, this is fine. If you already have a license, you'd like to save some money, then you can click yes, that I already have a license, and you confirm that you have this license. I'm going to choose no just for demonstration purposes and assume that you don't yet have a license, and click create. And we can see the cost is going to be about 21 cents an hour. And that's if you have it on at all times. So it's a good idea to turn off your virtual machine when you're not using it or just delete it altogether if you no longer need it. I'm going to look down the list to make sure that everything is set up the way I'd like it and click Create. And now we see in the upper right-hand corner, we are initializing our installation. The deployment is in progress. And it usually only takes about a minute for the virtual machine to be created. And then we'll take a look at the settings where it'll allow us to log into it using the remote desktop. If you look below under deployment details, some things are being set up, such as the IP address, the virtual network, diagnostics, things like that. And it's now completed. It only took about a minute. I can create another virtual machine or go to the resource. So I'm going to click on go to the resource. And if I miss that link, I'll find it again under the virtual machines link that was shown in the beginning of the video. The server has been started up by default. We see the start button is grayed out. However, I can stop it, restart it, connect, capture, all these different options. But what I really want to do is I want to connect to it using remote desktop. And here is my public IP address. So I'm going to copy that IP address to my clipboard. And now I'm going to open up the remote desktop client. So I can just right click and choose search. And this is from my host computer or my Windows 10 computer. I'm just going to go ahead and type in remote desktop. And as I type that in, remote desktop connection shows up and I'm going to paste in that IP address and click Connect. Remember your username and password that you used to create it and log in. You can also choose the Remember Me to help you log in a little faster the next time. It might still prompt you for the password, but the username will be filled in for you. And I'll click OK. Now this is just warning you that the identity of the remote computer cannot be verified. You want to connect anyway. And that's because we have not created a special public certificate to make this work. So we're using a self-signed certificate, which is fine. I'm just going to say don't ask me again, because I know for sure this is my remote desktop because I see the public IP address matches the one at the Azure site. And now we're logging in for the first time into our Windows 10 virtual machine from Microsoft Azure. Here we see all the privacy settings. It's always a good idea to turn most of these off if you'd like just to have additional privacy. Otherwise, some information will get off to Microsoft. But I'll just click to continue. At this point, if you have other computers in the network, make sure you press yes to this. Otherwise, it's going to turn network discovery off, and it takes a lot of effort to get it turned back on again. So this default web page comes up. I'm going to go ahead and close that. But uh, this is the basic Windows 10 computer, but it's a virtual machine sitting at Microsoft Azure. By default, Remote Desktop was turned on where you would normally turn that on manually if you were creating a virtual machine or a physical host machine in your own computer. But because it came from Azure and the only real way to connect to it is using Remote Desktop besides Secure Shell, then they go ahead and turn it on for you, which is nice. Just to show you the speed a little bit, I'm going to click on Calculator. And you see it's not quite as fast as it would be if we had chosen one of the higher end types of virtual machine configurations, you know, such as more RAM, more processors, that kind of thing. I'm going to double click on Edge just to show you how fast that comes up. And the speed really isn't bad, but at $152 a month, if you left it on all the time, that is a lot of money. <laughs> so. Uh, you might want to decide to choose one of those less expensive plans and see if it still works fast enough for you. What about connecting to other computers? Well, I did connect another Windows 10 client as well as a Windows server, and I can 
And I can connect to that server and that other client simply by using File Explorer and then clicking on Network. And then it shows me the other computers that are on the network. Now, I don't have those other computers on at this time, but if I did see those, I could double click and put in the username and password to connect. You can also join this computer to either an Active Directory domain on a virtual machine or to Azure Active Directory since it's considered internal from here. You don't have to set up any special firewall ports or make any VPN connections or anything like that since you're all in the same system. When you're all done, you can shut it down the exact same way that we did with a virtual machine on a physical host. However, if you don't see that it is shut down completely where the start button lights back up, then you can choose the stop button and that will for sure shut that down. Now, I did mention that my IP address might change the next time I go to boot it up and that's fine with me. I can always refresh the IP address just by refreshing the page. There's a lot of settings off to the left hand side where you can make changes such as adding drive space, capacity, make configuration changes, things like that. Even more changes than you would see in a regular Hyper-V manager. But we're not going to make those changes or take a look at that in this video. This video is going on long enough. We are going to make separate videos in this playlist where you can take a look at how to do a lot of these different changes.